Have you entered our giveaway with Looking Glass Gems? It's closing soon, so hop to our Instagram at the Pasty Tapes to enter now. Looking Glass Gems, beautiful, affordable crystal rhinestones. Shop lookingglassgems.com or live and in person at BurleyCon. This episode was brought to you with the support from listeners like you. Special thanks to superfan BFF level supporters Kyle H., the man with a hat, and Violet Passion. To support this podcast, join the Pacey Tapes fan club. Visit our website, thepaceytapes.com, to join now. Oh, hello! This is Blanche Debris, and you're listening to The Pasty Tapes, a burlesque podcast by Show My More, the steamiest Asian dumpling. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Pasty Tapes. I'm your host, Show My More, the steamiest Asian dumpling, recording live today from a doctor's office. Technically, it's... My doctor's office, except it's the part that's set up to look like a faux hotel room. <laughs> I don't know if I don't know if you guys know this, but to quote one of my doctors, I am probably narcoleptic. Let's do some tests to find out. And today I am doing those tests. Uh, I slept here overnight so that they could make sure I got a full night's rest. And then I am here all day in a windowless room while they listen and watch me. Um, And then they just make me take naps every two hours. So let's see how I do. If it sounds different, it's because I am not in my closet or under my blanket at home. I am in this doctor's office, fake hotel room situation. I did a bunch of tweets about this, um, which I think just shows that I know how to make any time a good time. So why don't we jump into today's episode? I had the honor of interviewing my next guest when they were in Chicago for a performance. I want to give a special shout out to Simona Signore for setting up this interview. Just a note, this interview takes place in a hotel, so there's some background noise. Again, it's not going to sound like under a blanket with my guest, uh, because I'm not. We're in a working, real-ass hotel, so I try to clean up the sound as much as possible, but it will sound different. All right. This guest... Miss Nude Universe 1975 began her burlesque career at the infamous Pink Pussycat in Hollywood, California. An active, in-demand entertainer with Sparky Blaine's American Showgirl Agency, this performer toured the United States, Canada, and Japan from the late 1960s through the 1980s. She is also the legend of honor this year at BurleyCon, and you can catch her in Seattle and take some of her classes, and it's going to be rad. This is a person who I can tell loves so many of you, and so many of you love her right back. This is my interview with burlesque legend Tiffany Carter. Tiffany Carter, tell me your burlesque origin story. When I was a little kid, I took dance classes. Around seven or eight years old, I started tap and ballet at a place in uh, La Puente, California, called Jerry Singer Studios. And I never forgot Jerry Singer because he was amazing because he was a tap dancer and had a wooden leg. He lost one of his legs in the war. And it was amazing to see this guy perform himself. So he had studios. And I started dance classes. So I never had any doubt in my mind that I wanted to be a dancer. Right. I was a little kid. I was going to be a dancer. I that. I used to idolize and watch TV shows, and Mitzi Gaynor and Julia Prowse was one of my all-time idols. I got to see her perform live a few times. And I took classes until my teens, then I started modern jazz. And I used to make up routines with my dad's music at home. He had a lot of jazz and a lot of great albums, and I used to put on his music and make up routines around the house all the time. Mm-hmm. So I never had any doubt that I wanted to be a dancer. I just didn't know it was going to be in burlesque. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I became pregnant at a very young age, had my son. Mm-hmm. And so by the time I'm 17, I'm now married and have a little boy to take care of. So when that marriage split up, I decided to get back to my dancing career because I had dropped it for a while, of course. And uh, I started go-go dancing. The first job I ever had was a go-go dancer at the top of a club in Anaheim, California, across the street from Disneyland. Yep. And I used to sneak up there 
and then I begged them to ask me to go go dance up there until my husband then at the time found out and he had a fit get out of there because he didn't want me dancing so when we split up I was I went back to the idea of work dance as the dancer I wanted to be a showgirl in Vegas but I found out you could not be a showgirl I was too short okay yeah I'd be five eight in her flat feet and I'm five six Oh. I was too short. And there was no ifs, ands about those rules. There still weren't to this day when I quit Jubilee that just finished a couple of years ago. Yeah. yeah, they still have the same rules about the girls, showgirls for that. But anyway, so one day I decided to go audition for uh, and talk to an agent when I turned legal age of 21. And uh, I got an agent in Cal- Hollywood, California, named Cora Lee, and she sent me to a dumpy bar <laughs> that was topless already then. And um, audition, I got the jobs. So that's how I first started. My first club I worked was a place in Long Beach, California. But I would go into Hollywood and see some other performers at these places like the Body Shop and the Classic Cat, and I would see people like Tura Santana, Delilah Jones and Angel Carter. These people there were a little bit older than me, and that's, and that's what I wanted to be doing. Okay. But in the meantime, I worked all these clubs around Los Angeles and had different jobs where Coralie was sending me all these different places until I got my foot in the door and started learning how to make some costumes and get a better burlesque job. Okay, yeah. Okay, so finally... I ended up getting a job at the Pink Pussycat in Hollywood, California. And they hired me first as a cocktail waitress. Okay. Which got my foot in the door anyway, which I'm glad I had that experience because you waited on a lot of celebrities there. And the people were wonderful. The owners treated me very well. So they finally put me on stage. So that was my actual first good burlesque job. What year was was that? Was at the Pink Pussycat. What year did you start at the Pink Pussycat? That would be like in around 1970. Okay. Yeah, because I had already gone through the whole trial and tribulation thing, working all these other clubs in Los Angeles. I had been arrested a few times and did some time in jail. Mm -hmm. And I I wanted to get out of that whole scene. Yeah. And Alice and Harry Schiller, then on the Pink Pussycat, actually helped me through that. Okay. They let me use their attorney to get to know uh, and get go back to court with me and help me through the whole system. And I was at Silver Brown Institute in Los Angeles, and I actually met her there. Wow. She came to the Pink Pussycat. Yeah. Because while I was in jail, the Manson trial was going on, and the Manson girls were in that jail when I was there. And believe me, it's something I never forgot. Oh my God, that sounds... Very weird. Now that it's the 50-year anniversary of that, and that story's coming out again, you're seeing magazines about it, Yeah, it freaks me out. Oh. Because those girls were the strangest thing you ever wanted to be around. Yeah. The vibes of them were so strong. It was oh amazing. God. Amazing, yeah. So anyway, I moved on from that. Right. I got the job at the Pink Pussy Cat. I worked there for a year or so, and Alice Schiller uh, named you after the clan. You didn't have your real name. Now, Cora Lee gave me the name Tiffany. Okay. Okay, so yeah. I was just Tiffany. Tiffany. And, uh, but when you worked for the Pink Pussycat, you were Fran Sinatra or Joa Bishop or Dina Martin, and I was Fran Sinatra. Okay. Uh, and the Pink Pussycat. Then I heard about a show coming up at a place called The Losers in Los Angeles. And they were going to hire a certain amount of girls with a certain look-alike body to do an exact replica of the Crazy Horse Saloon Paris show. Okay. And so that was an honor to get in that show. So I auditioned for that, and I got into that show, and it was well choreographed, well lit, costumes provided and all, acts all set for you. We did group numbers, we did individual acts, and I learned a lot from that show. And I worked there for a long time, and I have still friends that I've known since that show. We are still friends to this day. And now four of us from that show are all at Blessed Hall of Fame last year together. 
that from 1972 at the Bluesers in Los Angeles. Yeah. Do you want to give a shout out? It was Adina. She's the last one to join us. She's been to the Breath Call of Fame now two years. I think she's going to perform this year. Shenandoah, Lovey Goldmine, and myself. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, we've known each other that long. Wow. Yeah, it was a wonderful show. A lot of fun. Yeah. So we did our individual numbers. And so when things started changing, we were already nude. Now the things are happening where they're like the liquor license. They don't have their liquor license. Yeah, all these laws are going on. It was chaos. So everybody started doing different things, and we we were gonna they were gonna close this show. Mm -hmm. So that's when I contacted my friend Kit Natividad and asked her who she worked for, who is her agent. I just started to start traveling. Yeah. And I went to work for Sparky Bland, American Showgirl, same agent she had. Okay. And so I started traveling because it ended up the losers, they burnt it down. They destroyed everything. So it was a good thing. I was already starting to travel and had to get out of there anyway. So that's when I started touring. And in 1975, the Miss Universe, Miss New Universe pageant uh, came around, which was Sparky Blaine's baby. Mm -hmm. And I won the Miss New Universe pageant in 75. Kit and the Tividad crowned me. Wow. And so from then on, my, my whole career skyrocketed. My salary doubled. I started getting better money. And I toured all over the United States, Canada. I went to Japan one time. Mm -hmm. That was a, not through my agent, though, through a whole other thing. But anyway, until I got pregnant with my daughter. And when I got pregnant with my daughter, I, I danced till I was five months pregnant with her. Wow. Yeah. And then I decided to come home, have my baby, and stay back in Los Angeles. Okay. So that's what I did. Yes, but that's how everything started, and I got off on touring. Yeah. Tell, mm -hmm. me, tell me a fun tour story. Is there a memory <laughs> from one of your tours that you want to share? Everybody, some people know this story. When we worked on the road, you know, a lot of places you weren't protected. You had to protect yourself. I used to have a can of mace in my pocket, busting up boss in the combat zone, because it was pretty scary sometimes walking around those areas. Yeah. But I was working at the Brass Ass in Newport, Kentucky one time, and there was this guy that was just really harassing, being a loudmouth, noisy, obnoxious, and nobody was doing nothing about it. So I got mad, and I got off stage, and I whacked him with a beer bottle. Oh, my God. <laughs> you just whacked him with a beer bottle? <laughs> yep. And then what? <laughs> I got him out of there, obviously. Just <laughs> <laughs> yeah. whacked him one. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> what is one of your favorite places that you've been to? That's hard to say. I had a, a few favorites. Montreal around Quebec, I always had good, good, good vibes and good places I worked. I loved it around there because they were so unique and different to me. You know, because you'd go out of the city of Montreal and work in some of these little small elite places. Mm -hmm. Some were really fun and cute. One was really bad. Oh. It depends. Um, but it was nice to me because I grew up on the West Coast. So this yeah. was all different. The different the difference in the weather and all yeah. was fun. I loved going to Indianapolis every year because my, I grew up in a family that was totally car racing. Okay. My dad raced, drove them, built them, everything. Yeah. And my brother was a real fanatic about cars. So when I would go there, they would be there the year, the week of or week before the Indy 500. Mm -hmm. So one year I got to go meet all the drivers and get a lot of pictures and photos from my brother. He loved that. So stuff like that was fun. And plus, you'd have a real good time at the clubs. were really busy then. Of course. So I like that. Uh, it depends. There's a lot of cities I wished I would have seen that I didn't get to see. But... Sparky was funny. He didn't book a lot of places where there was an abundance of girls or a lot. So I loved New York City. I had a ball there. I worked at a theater there and got a lot of fun uh, people I met there at, in the city. Mm -hmm. ah, I just had a good time a lot of places. I was told to ask you. Yeah. Spinning bed? I, have a, I had a bed. Okay, what was I that had a prop. Like? I had a prop made mm -hmm. that was a round bed that turned. I had a switch on the side of it to make it spin real slow. And I made different fur covers for it, depending on what, no, what number I was doing. Mm -hmm. 
And I toured with that bed. I did a bathtub act. I did a Raggedy Ann doll that came to life. I did two different kind of cat numbers, a black panther and a tiger. I had gloves that lit up like claws on my fingers. Yes. And then I did my, uh, like a regular Gene Harlow type thing. So I would dream on my acts. I would dream everything I was doing. But anyway, so this bed I had made and toured with it. It was my prop. I would use it for my stocking peels and all that before I get into the bath or whatever and pose on it. And then when I was leaving the business in Detroit, the club owner wanted to buy it for me because he loved it. Okay. So I left it there because I was pregnant with my daughter. He bought it from me and I was lo- just in Detroit two weeks ago. I kind of wondered whatever happened to that. Yeah. That bed. We should hunt that down. Yes, but now Audrey Deluxe has a bed that turns. And it's funny because I had so many little things. She's, you know, she's gotten like I had years ago, right? Not even knowing that I had that. But yeah, it was wonderful. I, I had a box made especially for it to ship it everywhere. Yeah, my stepfather is, uh, my stepfather was a piano player for Ike and Tina Turner. And so they had band members had these crates made, you know, that they used to ship their stuff all over the world. Right. And he turned me on to the company, and that's who I had make this crate for the bed to be able to ship it. Yeah. Back and forth, wherever I was. And I'd have to go to customs and claim it when I went to Canada all the time. Yeah. But I worked with it all the time. I loved it. I made a white fur cover and a leopard print cover to go with my cat numbers. Talk to me about your cat numbers. My cat numbers. Yes. Well, I decided I wanted to be a little different with my cat numbers and do something that lit up. Mm-hmm. So I met a, a friend that... We got together talking in uh, Boston. He was an engineer about how I was going to do these claws and make them light up. And so he came up with a little light emitted dials on each fingertip. And we devised a little thing that was in the palm of my hand that had a switch on it. And I would flip it on and then the the dial would make it go faster or slower. And so he put these all on a leather glove, which I still have them. They don't work anymore, but I still have them. Yes. Then we, over that, we put a spandex black glove. So you didn't see all this underneath work. And I would just flick it with my thumbs like that and turn them and little lights on each one. So when I recreated my cat number, I wanted something else to light up. So now my whiskers light up. I, I was trying to find the article a while back because they did a whole write up on me about those gloves that lit up. And when I was in Detroit one year at one of the clubs I worked, okay, I was a, uh, probably buried deep in my chest somewhere because I know I have it somewhere. But yeah, they, uh, th- that was something because you know, you didn't see stuff like that in those days a lot. So it was real interesting. Right. I would do little quirky different things to make it uniquely me. Yeah. But I tell students this when I teach. Try to do some little thing, a little, a little thing. Like, for instance, my show I just did here. Me and Mrs. Jones is an old nostalgic number I've done for a long time. But what I did now is I added a rose, and I put a rose in my mouth, and I put one in my bra. So when I come out, I, I throw a rose to someone. Mm-hmm. Right? And so it's just a little thing you can do. You know, to make things uniquely you. Right. When I did my Raggedy Ann doll act years ago, I used to put suckers in my pockets of the apron and throw them out to the audience. So for fun, at Burlesque Hall of Fame one year, I said, I'm going to do a number from Breakfast at Tiffany's because I've been Tiffany for all these years and never did anything from the album. Mm-hmm. So I did a, a, a cut up from uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's And for fun, I put suckers in my bra, Mm -hmm. and I threw them in the audience. (laughs) (laughs) Just any little thing, you know, that you can think of to make something differently, or different, you can cute. Like, for instance, I used to have a lot of thick, long hair. I used to pull it up a lot under hats, too, and flip my hair out. Because my head pieces for my cat numbers, I had to do that anyway, because they were like a helmet thing, you know, that snapped under here. So, yeah. So just little stuff like that. Incredible. Be different. Yeah. Do you have a favorite costume you want to talk about besides I the did. Cat? Yes, I do. Okay, yeah. Tell me about it. A beautiful black fox coat. The costume designer I had, Bobby Gersten, 
was very, very good at uh, costumes, and he would come and watch you perform. Mm -hmm. If you came to Bobby with an idea you wanted to do, and he didn't think you fit that idea, he would tell you flat out, no, that's not good for you. But if he watched you perform and you came up with an idea he liked and designed things with him together, so he designed this coat for me that was black fox, solid Arroyo Borealis stones on top and black fox tufted fur, the cuffs here and all the way down. There's pictures of me in it. Yeah. That was very, very famous costume for me. I used to have people come to see just to see that costume. It was well, well known. Yeah. So that was my favorite, favorite piece. I've gone today, I sold it to a girl in London. She's, she's not a performer, so it's stored away somewhere. But I wore it in 2009 at Bluff Call of Fame. Yeah. 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 The coat. How did you start working with Bobby? Bobby Gerston, when I was at the Pink Pussycat in Hollywood, I met a man that was a doctor, Dr. Wayne. He used to come into the Pink Pussycat. He asked to meet me. And he said, I would like to buy you your first professionally made costume and introduce you to someone I know named Bobby Gersten. Okay. I was like, wow, okay. He took me to meet Bobby. I never made a costume again myself after I met him. He wow. was so fabulous. And Dr. Wayne and I just became really good friends. He was an anesthesiologist at Children's Hospital. Mm -hmm. And at one time he came and asked a couple of us girls if we wanted to go watch them perform a surgery on a newborn baby. Wow. Yeah. And he took us, and we had to suit up. It was a newborn baby that was born. The umbilical cord had, had not, had ripped open oh. in their tummy. Okay. And they had to stitch that back together. It was interesting because it was med back, flown there quickly for this. And that's why it was late at night when we got off work, we were able to see, watch this. Right. Yeah. It, a child years before would have died with that. Right. But they're able to stitch that area and break a plastic area over it so it could keep closing that area up and save the baby. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. Okay, so after a whole night of performing yeah. and entertaining. The doctor's like, you want to go see a surgery? And yeah. And go? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he invited us, a couple of us, to go see the surgery. Yeah. Yeah, so because of Dr. Wayne and being at Children's Hospital in Los Angeles, I used to take my children's toys and their stuffed animals and stuff when they were tired of them and were through with them, and I would take them and donate them to the children's hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Make them learn how to give. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You need to be, all this Christmas stuff and things you give, we're gonna give back. Yeah, of yeah. course. Uh. Oh. Tiffany, thank you so much for sharing about <laughs> your burlesque origin story and your history. Do you wanna talk about what, you know, burlesque has been like for you in the past 10 years? Well, you know, I was out of burlesque. Uh, I quit in 1989. Okay, yeah. I was done. I, I was running a club in Los Angeles, and the pole was there on the stage because it was just already a pole that was happened to be a prop on the stage where I was working. And so the things were changing. We're now we're now we don't have liquor. We have liquor. We don't have liquor, and all this changing again. And so they put enough. Uh, we, I, I uh, put on one private booth for private dancing, and it's a, a lot of the girls working, I had 42 employees there, and I was the first woman manager he ever had. He said, turn this club around for me, because things were happening like this, in and out of, you know, good or not good, you know, but he owned several clubs. Mm -hmm. I just got tired of it. I was like, at the point where, this is not what I used to do. I was getting married again, and I was I just wanted to get out. And so I did. I quit and uh, moved back to Oregon. Went a totally different lifestyle. Okay, yeah. And I started doing other things. And uh, I didn't come back till 2008 when I performed again at the Bruce Hall of Fame. I came back 2006 and saw what was happening mm -hmm. when they first brought it into Las Vegas from the ranch. Yeah. Because my girlfriend, Kitten, and Shenandoah, we'd all kept in touch. 
And Kip used to say, come to the ranch. Come to the ranch. What ranch? What are you talking about going to this ranch? I'm raising my kids. I'm like, you know, I'm out of this. And then my husband now actually coaxed me to come back too because when he found out what I used to do, he called Dixie Evans. He found out who she was Mm -hmm. and told her who I was. And she said, well, honey, if she says she says she is, come tell her to send me some photos, blah, 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 right? I said, what are you doing? Yes. <laughs> so in 2006, Shannon Doe and I got a hold of each other. I said, you know what? Let's go see what's happening. So she met me. We went to Vegas, and we were like, wow. This is more like what we used to do. The acts were going on. It was a lot of fun. The competition was there. And we ran onto these legends we hadn't seen in a long time. Kitten was there. I'm going to perform. We, I was like, oh, my God. Now I'm hooked again. I have to find out who's running this. Yes. What's going on here? Yeah. So I introduced myself. And I had to reintroduce myself. Nobody knew who Tiffany Carter was, of course. And uh, I did. And Luke got a hold of me the next year and asked me to perform. But I wasn't ready. Okay. I said, I'll be there. But I'm not ready to do this yet. I had foot surgery anyway, so I wasn't able to. Yeah. So in 2008, he contacted me again, and I was going to be at the Palms that year. And so in 2008 was my first time back on stage. Mm -hmm. Scary. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm hard. (gasps) Right. Yeah, but it was wonderful, and the people were wonderful, and there I was. I went back again, and we moved to Las Vegas and been there like nine years now. So then I got more involved with the Blessed Call of Fame, and next thing you know, you start to get, you know, so there I am doing festivals now and recreating some more acts, and right. here you go. Yeah. What do you have to say to performers today? What advice do you want to share as we close out this interview? There's so much I'd like to say, a lot of it. Yeah. Uh, good and bad. The neo burlesque scene is fun. It's a lot of fun. I like the variety. I love the idea that we all work together now. Uh, the guys never worked with us before. We were separate. So now we have the guys, we have the groups, we have the uh, performers all in one, you know, big bash of what we call what we call burlesque. Mm-hmm. It's fun. Uh, if, if I was a newcomer today, first of all, I would take classes, but I would really seek out my teachers and who's teaching these classes, and I would learn from someone that's really got a good history of teaching or from a legend. Yeah. Just to get your basics. Yeah. I don't care. And it depends where you want to go with burlesque. There's so many reasons people are doing burlesque today. We used to make a living at it. I raised my children doing this. Today, it's not like that. Right. You have to either have a regular daytime job or make a career of that doing something else. Like you're making costumes or you're producing shows or you, you know, so many different facets of it today. So it's hard. It's not easy. And there's a lot of different reasons people are doing this. Is it because you want to just have fun and, and go with the flow? Is it because you want to become a headliner? Or is it because you, or you like to compete? Or is it because you just want to entertain your husband or your lover? You know, there's different reasons now. It's totally different. So I would just say to learn the basics, you know, and then go from there. And and if you're going to really want to be a headliner or go up in the business, then you should create one really good signature act. Once you get that down and you become busy, then create other acts from there. Yeah. Depends, you know, but there's so many people now doing these theme shows, right? That they're creating a different act every two or three months or something, or more, more often than that. I just talked to a lady in Detroit teaching a class. She had already done 26 different acts this year. This year? What? I mean, so if you're having fun doing those theme things and that's for you, so have fun with it. Go, go for it. But if you really, really, really want to do, you know, above and beyond, like become like a headliner or anything like that, I think you should have one really signature act because costumes are so expensive. Right. You need to make one really beautiful piece, 
really outstanding, you know, yeah. because you're going to have to awe the people. And today that's not easy in our world. Right. You know, especially with, uh, we should do 25 and 30 minute shows, six, six songs and do a, like a story. Today, four minutes. Right. Four and a half minutes. I like to do six minutes. That's about average for me. I can't imagine four minutes. It's not easy. Yeah. But you can still tease and you can still play with it and be able to do that. But it's tough. That makes it even tougher. But that's the way our world is today. We're always changing. It's going to be changing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, yeah. Wow. But also, videos are important. Mm -hmm. I've looked at several because you, as a legend, you're asked to look at videos for like for Las Call of Fame, maybe, if you, uh, or Viva Las Vegas that goes on, or, uh, and you can look at, you know, a lot. Videos, you want to submit a really good done video because a lot of them at sad. I may think the person is gorgeous, but I'm not seeing them visually well. The audience is in the way. It's not clear. So you really want to put out a good video and you should have some great photos done. Okay. Got our jobs before were photos, photos. You should still have some good photos done. Have a good photo shoot. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. Tiffany Carter, oh. thank you so much for talking with me on yeah. the Pasty Tapes. <laughs> People can see you this year at BurleyCon. And yes. I'm if, so excited. Yes, I love BurleyCon. And if they want to find you, they can find you on Facebook? Yes. Perfect. Yes. There's a blog for BurleyCon too that I've been actually I'm on that now too. I haven't posted a lot on there yet, but yeah, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram as well. Yes. So, uh, yeah, I'm excited. Thanks so much, Tiffany. You can catch burlesque legend Tiffany Carter at BurleyCon. They are this year's legend of honor. On Friday and Saturday, they'll be doing a My Life with Tiffany Carter session. And on Saturday, they'll be leading chair play. You can catch me at BurleyCon all weekend long. I will be teaching twice. I'll be teaching at BurleyCon for the first time ever this year, and I'm teaching twice. You can catch my workshop, Cooler on the Internet, Thursday at 530 and on Friday morning at 8.30, I'll be leading a Burley lab called Social Media in Your Sleep. If you want to have some internet fun with me, catch one or both of my workshops, I would love to see you in them. I would also love to see you just around BurleyCon. So if you see me, please stop me and say hello. I might even have a special prize for you. I don't know. We'll see. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Pasty Tapes. Please hit that subscribe button. Tell all your friends about it and leave five stars on Apple Podcasts. I also absolutely want to hear from you. So leave me a voicemail or a text on the Pasty Tapes hotline. That is 1-530-PASTIES, 1-530-727-8437. Or you can always send an email to thepastytapes at gmail.com. If you want to join the Pasty Tapes fan club, visit thepastytapes.com and I will send you a care package with so much adorable merch and my undying love. Special thanks to superfan BFF level supporters Kyle H., the man with the hat, and Violet Passion. Extra thanks to Tony Tabasco, Kits and Sass, Rosalie Bloom, Fufu Kaboom, Big Moody Judy, Margot Royale, and KK. Also some love to Kitty LaRoyal, Aria Delanocha, Betty Beware, Dixie Disaster, Cece Bombay, and Mother Girth. You can find me, Show My More, across the internet at Show My More. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Pasty Tapes, and I will talk to you soon. You have been listening to The Pasty Tapes, a burlesque podcast by Show My More, the steamiest Asian dumpling. This is Blanche Debris saying thanks for listening, and see you later, ducklings. Okay, they're here. My pins are here. They are wonderful. They are designed by Blue's Chicken. If you want to check them out, they are on my Instagram, at Show My More. And you can buy one off of me in person whenever we cross paths. Or you can slide into my DMs and I'll give you my payment info and I'll mail one out to you. I am traveling across the Midwest this winter. I am performing in Chicago November 1st at the Newport Theater in La Chic Showcase by the Chicago Academy of Burlesque. On November 15th, I will be in Columbia, Missouri at the Blue Note with The Best of Show Me by Lola Van Ella. On the 16th, I'll be performing at the Monocle in St. Louis with Flavor of the Month, a Holiday Potluck by Lola Van Ella. 
On the 22nd, I'll be in Blackheart's Burlesque in Minneapolis. And on the 23rd, I'll be in Take It Off, a fat burlesque review at Poor House, also in Minneapolis. If you want to catch up with me, again, find me across the internet at Show My More or visit my website, showmymore.com.